everybody. Uh, it's very nice to be here. It's very nice to be here in Heidelberg. It's my first time uh, at uh, DjangoCon Europe. Uh, this talk, uh, um, I presented it in a slightly different way yesterday, uh, yesterday here at um, uh, PyCon in uh, Florence. And uh, uh, the funny thing about this talk is that uh, uh, one year to the next, a lot of things changes, uh, and uh, so it's very nice to to revisit. Uh, and um, um, we will talk about remote working. Uh, remote working is an extremely big topic. We will just cover the tip of the iceberg, and uh, I will try to make it short, so there could be time for some questions at the end. And uh, um, it's very nice to do it in a conference when uh, there is streaming, live streaming, so there are people out there watching now, probably remote developers. So I would say hello to everyone who is a remote developer and is taking time out of their schedule to watch the conference uh, from another location, which is kind of uh, the point of the whole thing. So uh, another thing, it's Towel Day. Uh, I work for a company that has 42 in the name, so we cannot just uh, ignore it. And uh, our company motto is don't panic, uh, which is always uh, a very useful thing to say and to keep in mind. The other thing uh, is uh, GDPR Day. So again, don't panic. Um, it's very nice to be in such a theater. I it's probably my first time on a proper stage uh, with a proper microphone and uh, with all the technology. So it's, uh, it's tempting to feel like a rock star. I'm not a rock star. And uh, so I would like to introduce a bit uh, uh, who I am and the people I work with because uh, uh, it's very relevant for um, the kind of talk uh, I'm introducing. Uh, I'm mostly a web uh, developer, always been in my career, uh, and uh, especially I work with uh, Django and Python, and that's the reason I'm here. Uh, as I said, I work with a company that has uh, Agile 42 in the name. It's a coaching and training company, and we are a very distributed company in Europe, uh, in North America, and in South Africa. And especially uh, our web and IT team uh, has an headquarter in Berlin and a number of people, including myself, uh, that work uh, remotely. And uh, in particular, I work from Milan. And uh, not only I work uh, remotely for this job, uh, but I used to do it also for previous jobs. So I have uh, a bit of experience in that. Uh, I've seen it all. I've also worked in offices, so I see the difference. And uh, basically, the question I ask myself uh, every day is uh, how this is possible to do effectively and without too much stress. Uh, you know the dream. Uh, the dream is to be an IT worker that uh, works whenever they want, um, usually from the, from the beach, uh, with uh, flexible hours, uh, living a very nice lifestyle. Um, but actually, the reality is that uh, uh, you work uh, out of a cramped space, uh, you work uh, in not very good hours, uh, you basically have all the problems of working in an office uh, and none of the perks like uh, chatting with your friends uh, at the water cooler or around a cup of coffee. Not to mention that uh, remote working has this kind of perils. It's, it's very nice uh, that you still laugh at this slide because uh, uh, it's a slide from last year and I was wondering, will it be still relevant today? Because, uh, but yeah, you, you know what I'm talking about. So uh, let's get a bit uh, to uh, the core problem that we may face. Um, I took this quotation from an article that is uh, linked there from Zach Holman, and I think uh, it uh, uh, encapsulates very nicely the problem. Uh, what's the difference between a remote-friendly company and a remote-first company? 
A remote friendly company is a lot of IT companies these days. You can do uh, one or more days of work at home, you can take time off, you can do flexible hours. The result is is what really counts, and not the number of hours you spend in the office. But still, there is an office and people who choose not to work in that office. A remote-first company, instead, is a company that breaks the structure of the office work and creates a workflow that allows people to contribute in a more free uh, environment and a more free structure. And that's really the challenge for this century. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we work uh, in agile coaching. Agile methodologies, the whole uh, culture of agile, uh, tries to help companies to work better and uh, workers to work more effectively without burning out. So we ask, uh, can agile methodologies help remote workers, uh, or uh, can agile methodologies help a remote culture in the company? Uh, we think uh, there are a, a certain set of agile methodologies that uh, definitely help uh, uh, remote working. For example, a culture of TDD, which means test drive and development, uh, uh, which means that you create first a set of tests uh, against which you run your code actually helps a lot remote teams because it sets a number of boundaries um, that don't just work because people share the same code intimately over the same keyboard, but uh, in a more flexible environment. No code over ownership the same uh, it's easier to work with a remote colleague if uh, we all agree that a certain area of the code can be uh, improved by all members of the teams. And especially uh, what we call uh, visual radiators, uh, meaning that uh, you have structures that help understand what's the status of the project, like a backlog, boards, uh, all kinds of artifacts that uh, you can either share in your office or uh, in a virtual board. But then comes the kicker. Uh, we know instead from experience uh, and from work with companies uh, that actually the most effective teams are the ones that are co-located, meaning that they work in the same office. Uh, for example, in large American companies, uh, they, they discover that uh, not only they have to be on the same building, but they have to be tied together, even if people um, uh, have nice offices, uh, far from each other, it's better to put them together so they can contribute more. That seems to break um, the whole reason of uh, remote working. Uh, this is a principle from the Agile Manifesto, and we know it's uh, a few years old uh, right by now, and it says explicitly that the most efficient and effective method of conveying information to and within a development team is face-to-face -face conversation. So, this looks like a problem. Um, but I would like to parse uh, this uh, principle because uh, it seems obvious from, uh, uh, from the face of it, uh, and I think it keeps standing if you uh, check carefully what it means. So, for example, we should discuss exactly what we mean by face-to-face. -face. Because uh, in the good old days, uh, it was uh, quite obvious to say that face-to-face -face meant uh, some people in the office, uh, or even some people around the table. Some people around the table discussing the problems of a software project. But now we are in a completely different uh, culture. Um, 
part of what face-to-face -face meant uh, was uh, proximity, you are next to your colleague, but also a sense of truthfulness, meaning that uh, what face-to-face -face, uh, uh, was against uh, was against uh, thick documentation that moved from one level to another, uh, large meetings when there is no real discussion, and these kind of things that were common in enterprise uh, uh, development. So a face-to-face -face discussion not only means that we are standing with our bodies uh, in short proximity, also means that we talk to each other without a barrier and telling things exactly how they are. Uh, in the 21st century, in 2018, we have a lot of this conversation in chats, group chats, uh, over electronic messaging. You can be really true with your colleague in Slack, uh, and uh, you can just say a lie face to face. So Slack, Skype, WhatsApp, and Gout are now very common tools uh, for teams. And this is 99% uh, of what face-to-face -face means uh, in that sense. Of course, there is still uh, an aspect of body language uh, and uh, uh, the pleasure of interacting with each other that we, we don't want to discount, but it's, uh, um, it's not the key part of face-to-face. -face. And the reason to be face-to-face -face is to exchange information. So what can we call information uh, in the area of a project development? Well, the most obvious is discussion about the project, so how we should do some things, how we should move forward, and so on. Very specific details about the code, very specific details about design, uh, the artifacts that the development team does. And also, you want to communicate to your team um, the things that worked, commits, uh, tasks done, the things that didn't work, uh, all the bugs, all the regressions, and you want to uh, chit-chat and grow that team culture that is very important for a successful project. Uh, yes, this is all information, and uh, these are all things we talk to our colleagues about. Uh, do we really need to be in close proximity to do this, uh, not necessarily because all these things you can, for example, rely on a Slack channel. Uh, you know, Slack is very popular, or Skype chat, or even good old email. Um, some of these things are actually better to be discussed online, especially if you um, are talking about code or design, having a shared screen helps you more than just uh, discussing it at a meeting, you know? So we go back to that article by Zach, and uh, where he says that uh, uh, using a culture where everything you do is either manually or automatically pushed into a communication channel, and for example, he mentioned chatbots, you know, uh, a tool that takes an action from some other system and puts it automatically in your chat, then you create a culture where it's not important if you're in the office, it's not important if you're in the office that day, it's not important if, in the, if you are in the office ever, because basically we are all remote workers from different locations, some of them accidentally are in the same office, and we all contribute to the same project and to the same communication channel. So, basically, it's a cultural challenge rather than uh, uh, a plain old technical challenge. Uh, this is a new slide that I added a couple of days ago. Um, there are articles from uh, the enterprise side of things, uh, from example, from the Harvard Business Review, that start to talk about this change in the workplace. You know, it's not just for one team here and there, but it's a real change that's happening in the workplace where electronic 
Electronic tools are the glue that, they, uh, that keep together a remote team. This is a, a, a tweet from uh, uh, Lee Bryant, a researcher at PostShift, and uh, I suggest you check him out. Uh, he always writes very interesting stuff. So, uh, one reason to do this uh, at a conference like uh, Django, DjangoCon is to uh, help uh, uh, teams and individuals that want to go down this, uh, down this path. So, here I would like to, uh, to tell how we do it uh, with our team at Agile42. Uh, basically, we have a lot of shared stuff. We have a shared code repository and uh, uh, possibly this is reachable from the outside. So, you know, uh, you have GitHub, you have Bitbucket, uh, some companies may have security issues. It's something you can work around. Uh, we have automated unit testing and integration testing. That's what I said, that uh, agile methodologies uh, or plain old methodologies from uh, extreme programming, uh, they come uh, uh, very useful because uh, uh, all testing helps create a safety net for developers, especially developers who don't have uh, someone next desk to confront with. Uh, they can just uh, rely on the structure and uh, uh, they can move their code forward um, in a more sustainable way. Of course, we have continuous integration, which is pretty common nowadays, but uh, helps us with uh, um, contributing uh, code from different individuals who are not necessarily synced, especially in, uh, in time zones or in uh, working hours. Uh, we have uh, boards, uh, we use uh, uh, all kinds of task planning and uh, uh, also we like to test a lot of things. All of this, of course, must be available from any location and all of this goes into a channel which is our main communication channel and the uh, heartbeat of our project. Um, but of course, you also have to adjust your personal style and the way that the team interacts with each other uh, in order to make it work. Um, you, if you do agile uh, methodologies, and I strongly suggest you should do it, uh, uh, and you do your agile ceremonies, starting with the daily stand-up, with the sprint planning, the review, the retrospectives, and whatever your method calls for. Uh, you do it online. You do it in a way that allows remote workers to uh, attend and remote workers to contribute. Uh, for example, with my team, we connect regularly over Skype. We even uh, see each other. That helps with the... Uh, uh, distance barrier, and we do our sprint reviews, we do our daily stand-ups. Uh, you should not work alone in the sense that uh, you wake up in the morning, you just uh, hack your code and you go to bed, uh, poss possibly other things as well, but uh, uh, you should contribute uh, to the life of the project. You should say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Uh, or uh, if you are going to do that to a colleague, then I can help, or I think this is a better idea uh, to follow up. Uh, one thing that I discovered in my career that is uh, a bit against the whole dream of uh, remote working is that uh, having working hours that are compatible uh, with the rest of the team, especially if you have some team, some parts of the team that work out of an office and therefore they do something more closely aligned to nine to five, uh, or at least uh, to be available uh, around uh, the time where you expect uh, other members of the team uh, to be online. And you have to keep uh, that chat channel open during work hours. It's uh, uh, it's basically your way of checking in in the office and checking out from the office. Um, I know that uh, 
uh, a major company that does remote working, full remote working, so we'd say remote first, uh, has a, a one of the few requirements is to keep uh, the chat channel open during work hours. Uh, you cannot be remote 100% of the time. Uh, occasionally you have to meet. Uh, if it's more than occasionally, it's nice. Uh, the kind of interactions you have when you are face-to-face -face are different from the ones you have online, and sometimes they are just funnier, or, they ju or sometimes they are just uh, uh, more forward-thinking, so it helps with the planning, and so every remote team should just uh, meet occasionally just to sync up uh, and to uh, put a face uh, to the uh, presence online. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, there are a few companies, uh, I just named two, uh, that uh, do remote first. Uh, they like to talk about it, they like to explain uh, the tools they're using, and so it's a good source of inspiration. Uh, this is, for example, a screenshot, and uh, I understand that it's, uh, uh, the details may be lost, but uh, this is uh, uh, a screenshot from our own uh, Slack channel of developers, uh, and you see, for example, uh, Slack bot that remind us of uh, uh, agile ceremonies, like a stand-up, uh, an error message from our, from our um, bug tracker, uh, Trello, which we use for lightweight project management, uh, um, sending out comments about uh, uh, um, a work in progress, uh, and things like this. So, uh, and uh, you see the comments, you see, for example, um, coming from, uh, from GitLab, uh, comments attached to a specific story, they are pushed also into the channel. That's what we meant as chatbots, trying to keep the communication channel alive and to put everything so we can comment on. Uh, these are a lot of statuses from our um, continuous integration project. And this is much more lively discussion about a certain feature, what we should do about it. And uh, I can say that uh, I'm not sure uh, where the people were at that time. I was remote in Milan, but other people were probably on vacation and contributing a little bit. So this is a way we keep a project moving forward. And of course, the, they come from Slack, which a lot of people are using these days for this. So um, we are using a lot of tools to do that. And these tools change constantly over time. We are continu continuously refining and changing. Uh, uh, as we said, uh, we do test-driven development, uh, and we use uh, unit tests, uh, Selenium. We have a lot of visual tests to align uh, with what we want to achieve. Uh, we try to do infrastructure as code, uh, another layer that helps us uh, get away from the uh, concept of having uh, a staging server and a test server. Uh, at the moment, we mostly use virtual machines, but uh, uh, Docker is a very nice solution. So um, I was very happy to hear from Lacey from the uh, talk before. Uh, if I understand correctly, she's also a remote developer. So we see how all these techniques uh, come together. And recently, we've moved uh, to GitLab, uh, our own hosted GitLab as a Git repository and uh, a project center for our, uh, for, for our development. Uh, this also uh, allows us to uh, use pipelines uh, for continuous integration, tying even uh, closer together the development, uh, uh, the project management, uh, and the continuous integration uh, inside GitLab. Uh, at that point, we integrated GitLab with Slack and uh, with Sentry, uh, which is a tool to alert of bugs. Uh, and uh, we created this chatbot uh, that uh, uh, allow us to see almost everything that is happening in the project in real time. Uh, we also moved uh, 
project management to GitLab with boards uh, and some Trello, which is always nice because it's very lightweight. As I mentioned, we use Skype for the Agile ceremonies and Google Docs, whatever. Basically, we try everything that can be helpful for uh, having a team that is not in the same office to coordinate and exchange information. Here I have a screenshot of a pipeline. Uh, a pipeline is uh, in GitLab is uh, um, a set of tasks that you can do to uh, test and build and install on either staging or development machine. And uh, this is very helpful because it's triggered automatically by a commit in the repository. And these allow us to work uh, as a team uh, and not having, for example, a person who is uh, only tasked with uh, uh, in code integration and uh, code testing and therefore may, be f may feel detached from the team. Uh, as you can see here, uh, in we develop, sorry, we uh, configured uh, web hooks uh, from uh, GitLab uh, into Slack uh, to notify uh, everything that's happening in the project inside uh, our communication channel, and uh, uh, therefore to be alerted about what's going on. Uh, one other tool that uh, uh, I wanted to mention is uh, uh, Sentry, which is uh, um, an add-on to your code that alerts you of uh, uh, errors uh, and uh, problems uh, and uh, uh, is configured to feed into the, the Slack channel as well. So if we go back to this, you see, for example, notification from, from Sentry that uh, uh, happen automatically on the channel and allow the team uh, to talk straight away about what's going on, if it's just uh, a small problem or if it's a major problem and needs, uh, uh, needs to be tackled. Uh, here, instead, you see more uh, notification about, uh, uh, about the, the code and uh, uh, the integration of pipelines uh, coming from, uh, from GitLab, uh, all marked with the, um, with the team member that contributed to that code, allow us to give a sense of what's going on in the development at that specific moment. And uh, so, for example, you see uh, the great uh, advantage of this approach uh, is to intermix uh, uh, this automatic uh, notification, for example, from GitLab, with uh, personal comments. This means that you don't have a separated channel uh, for um, the, the more technical stuff, but it's all part of the team discussion and uh, uh, you can have a better sense of what's going on in the project without having to move from one project, uh, from one tool to the other. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, I think uh, I ran a bit uh, fast uh, because I'm always afraid of uh, uh, going too late, so I'm open for questions. Thank you. That's for you. Thank you. Um, we have time for questions. Um, oh. Hey, hello. Uh, hi. Hi. I am a 100% uh, full-time reward worker. Cool. Um, I don't do meetings in person. I don't go uh, mm -hmm. to see clients. The, the only time I see clients is uh, events like this and one of the things you said kind of uh, bothered me and I wanted to uh, know if you could um, tell, tell more about this is that you said that you uh, a lot of companies wanted the communications channel to be open uh, during business hours yes. or, and uh, this in my experience is really bad because people see you online and they want to talk to you and so you don't have 
your time to concentrate and do your work, you're uh, constantly interrupted. So do you have any guidelines that you want to uh, yeah. share to, to avoid this kind of problem? Yes, no, it's, uh, um, it's an extremely good question uh, because it opens up a whole area, uh, which is kind of team management. So what do you expect from your team members and so on? Uh, in this respect, I don't think it's different from uh, a team that is collocated in the same office. Uh, you shouldn't assume that since your co-worker is at the, dex, at the desk uh, next to you, is always ready to take questions. And uh, this basically happens uh, uh, in the same way when you're remote. Uh, since you're remote, you're not um, expected to be available to chat at any moment uh, because uh, um, uh, just because you know you have a green dot uh, next to your avatar or uh, something similar depending on on the tool you use um, one thing that I skipped over because it's uh, it's a whole lot other it's a lot of other things is uh, you have to have a working agreement with your team a working agreement is a term we use a lot in, in agile coaching and basically it starts with nothing with an empty piece of paper and can grow to be extremely complicated the working agreement you have with your team is for example that uh, um, you have uh, you are online uh, it doesn't mean that you're available um, you may say on the channel well Today I'm just doing lightweight work uh, and uh, so I'm free if anyone uh, uh, needs help. Or the contrary, usually you're free but uh, if, you, if today you're going to do something that really needs concentration, I'm not available for anything. Uh, I cannot give you exactly what's best. The thing I can say is you have to talk about it in the team. Uh, you have to come up with something that is probably written down because it helps. Just uh, you have a shared document and you put down these rules. That's what uh, we prefer to call it working agreement. Uh, sometimes the rules uh, are pushed down by management. That's unfortunate. Sometimes it's necessary. Uh, the, uh, the thing I said uh, is yes, management asked this as to have the chat or, uh, the chat uh, channel open. Uh, it's good or it's bad? Well, they probably have their reasons. It's something that is part of a discussion. Um, and it's uh, as part of an agile coaching company, something that probably get a lot from us. I'm sorry, you have to talk about it uh, because that, that, that's the key. No? You, have to, you have to define your own process. Uh, one thing uh, um, I can suggest more precisely. Uh, one of the ceremony is the, uh, is the daily stand-up. It's uh, common to most agile methodologies. And we found that it's very useful. Uh, even if uh, you and the rest of your team are working on different projects or different sub-projects, different tasks, uh, even if you work remotely at even at different uh, time zones, you should find uh, a time each day to sync up uh, with the rest of the team. So for example, uh, myself and my team, we do it at 3 p.m. each day and over Skype. Um, if you're really busy uh, with your project or from the task you're doing, which is part of a larger project, you should still find time to do these five to 15 minutes. And these five to 15 minutes say to the rest of the team, I'm working on this. I'm sorry, guys, I cannot help with anything else because I'm 100% focused on this. And the team should understand. Then at that point, if someone chats you up, uh, oh, did you see that thing? I said, I'm sorry, I said very specifically that uh, today is devoted to this. So it's, um, then we enter in the area of rudeness, which is a completely different thing. <laughs> um, and uh, since it's a ceremony and uh, it's not when you have time, but it's a fixed time each day, you plan your day around it. So e if you know if it's first, first thing in the morning or after a break and so on, it's not interrupting you because you plan your day around it. Everyone gathers around either 
in person or uh, with a tool, and they tell each other how much they are available to help each other with the things I'm working on. Hope it helps. Thank you. There's another question at the back if you're up for that? Yep, definitely. Yes. Thank you. Um, I too had a, an issue with one of the things you said. Yeah. You said uh, no code ownership. Mm -hmm. um, this uh, resonated with one of my personal mantras, which is if you write it, you own it. Okay. Which means um, take responsibility. So, how do you avoid if people are not allowed to own parts of the code? How do you avoid um, that nobody takes responsibility for problems that arise? Well, uh, the, the responsibility is, is from the team. Uh, if you work in a team, and uh, uh, our idea is that we always work in a team rather than individuals, uh, of course, if you're, if you're being subcontracted to just work on a specific piece of software and uh, um, uh, you're the only one really working on it, uh, and so things may be different. But in most cases, you work on a project as a team. Uh, the the code uh, is owned by the team, the team has responsibility, and individuals within the team may uh, take action on a specific part of code, on a specific task, always saying to the rest of the team, we are doing this because of this, uh, I've chosen this solution because of this, other members may contribute or may even change it, giving explanations. Now, if someone from your team uh, entering the code you've been working on for six months at very uh, astute level with a lot of good ideas, and uh, put bad, co bad code inside it uh, because it uh, didn't understand what you were trying to do, and commits it, then again, we enter the state of rudeness. Uh, it's a problem within the team. It's a problem that uh, uh, your colleagues are not uh, up uh, to the same level of quality that you have, and you should have a discussion with them about this. So, uh, uh, I understand, since I, I, ha I always had a career as a developer, how we feel about uh, 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 the code and the artifacts we have developed. Uh, without entering into the world of code reviews uh, and uh, also pair programming, which is very useful and now basically can also be done online uh, in, in a number of ways, uh, you should always be up for uh, discussion and review of what you've done with the rest of the team. And in this respect, uh, the responsibility of what the code does moves from yourself personally to the whole team. I don't know if it's the answer you wanted to hear. No, it's exactly what I wanted to hear. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, there's one more question in the front. So, <coughs> I wanted to add to the first question. Yes, sir. And uh, I think that, like, one of the most common problems with tools like Slack is defining what has to be real time communication mm -hmm. and what can happen offline. It's like, yes. so, Imagine I have an issue. I want to talk to someone. It's like a lightweight meeting. We chat for five minutes. That works. But if there is something that requires somebody's attention and doesn't have to happen immediately, uh, then an email is probably better or a ticket on whatever. So my question is, how do you define the things that can go on Slack and things that you probably better not put on Slack because then they will be buried by 500 more messages and it was something that could have waited, and it's better if you deal with it like once yes. a day when you look at your, your emails or tickets or whatever. Yes, sure. No, I, uh, as you probably noticed from, from my hair, I'm not exactly um, a freshman out of college. So I, I grew up with email, and I still f uh, find that email is an extremely valuable tool. You can express your uh, point of view, especially about design of code or a project, uh, much more clearly, and allows for... Um, 
also for a bit more time to articulate your message. So, uh, my co-workers get a lot of emails from me. You know, it's, uh, uh, I'm active on, on the company Slack, but they get more emails and sometimes they say, oh, it's one of those long emails from Alessio again. And they say, well, um, how, what, uh, which is my, you know, boundary between Slack, you know, real-time communication and the email. I think uh, uh, the synchronous, asynchronous evaluation is the best one. Um, as I mentioned, I have a rough feeling of the time uh, my co-workers are in the office uh, or they are active. I don't know for sure, especially, you know, 5 p.m., is he in, is he out, or whatever, but I have a rough idea. So um, uh, I don't slack uh, at evenings, uh, Saturdays and Sundays, or things like that. And also, I don't push uh, long uh, discussions over Slack. Uh, by definition, a long discussion, something that I want to say about the project, doesn't need to be <coughs> resolved in the, in the next five minutes. It's something that can wait and can also have a longer discussion. And uh, I, um, so I put it in an email and I explain, well, uh, these are, this is my point of view. We can discuss it. Or sometimes I say, um, if you have some idea, just uh, let's chat about it or uh, let's review it at the next stand-up meeting, which is always a good thinking point for this kind of, uh, this kind of stuff. Uh, now, way. Nowadays, I've uh, uh, I've moved to in even more asynchronous way, uh, meaning if I have something very long to say, I usually put it in a Google Doc, uh, allowing other members of the team to comment and even edit what I what I've written. Um, I use uh, uh, chats, basically now Slack, but in the past it was Skype and other tools. First, uh, when, I, um, when I have something to ask to a coworker of mine uh, that would be in a, a traditional office, just uh, uh, moving to their desk and asking. So, are you working on this? Uh, have, you, have you seen that problem? Do you think we should act immediately or it can wait? Uh, what are your plans for today and things like this, or help, help, help. Uh, the server has a system load, uh, system load of 120 and I ran out of ideas uh, and that's probably uh, the best use for an instant message, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Last slide, I will put them on SlideShare. There are some links uh, to things I talked about, and uh, don't panic. <laughs>